Hi, I'm Julie. Before I start, I need to tell you a story, just to kind of wake everyone up a little. I know it's tired. We're all tired. You're all tired. I'm tired. Um, in 1998, I had my learner's permit. That dates me already. But I was driving home um, on a busy road around here, and it was pouring rain, and the windshield wipers on my 1985 Toyota Camry just stopped working out of the blue. And I was stuck, kind of panicking. My heart was pounding. The, the water was ponded on the road that I was on. And I have this very traumatic memory around that. I don't know how I got out of that situation. Somehow I did. It was before cell phones. Did someone come pick me up? I don't know. But I'm here, so I, I survived. Um, <laughs> but it took me a long time and looking at many hydrographs and tidal gauges of this area to realize that as a teenager, I was stuck in a 1 in 25 year event during the 1998 El Nino. Um, and it strikes me that while that was not a mega flood like Robin was talking about, or like what we're seeing um, in Florida or in Texas right now or all the way, other places in the world, it strikes me that what happened last this winter for us here um, we had a series of very um, exciting events from a hydrologic perspective. Um, Hopefully no teenagers were stuck in their cars. Um, and you know that reminded us about the physical processes that are really still intact, even though we have highly modified our estuary. The flow of water and sediment um, is really powerful, and we need to take that into account. And as Robin was talking about, it's only projected to get more intense and um, more frequent. That is the wrong way. Um, so this last winter, we saw flooding in cities. Um, we saw roads closed. We saw uh, wetland. Um, we saw levees in the delta breaching, um, and so this flooding impacted different parts of the bay in different ways, depending on those processes, depending on that setting, and depending on the land uses and many other things. So, what I really want to talk to you today. Um, it has been hinted at already, but it's about how do we work with the processes that still control and drive the shoreline? Um, how do we work with the flow of water and sediment to make our shoreline more adaptable and more resilient? This is the situation that we're in. Um, so you've seen this before. Here's our kind of muddy definition of the shoreline. It's very long, very complex as you're learning uh, going around, and many of you know this very well. Um, it's very diverse in terms of the communities that live there, um, the infrastructure we have, um, the vulnerabilities that we have, but it's also really diverse in terms of the physical processes that drive it. Um, and so it follows then that sea level rise and climate change are going to continue to impact different parts of the shoreline in different ways. Um, and so this has been talked about already, but we're working with several partners, including SPUR, funded by the regional board, to develop um, what we're calling operational landscape units, which are sort of a different way of thinking about the bay defined by these physical processes, the flow of water and sediment, groundwater recharge. Um, and we encourage, sort of, we're trying to think about how do we design and plan at this scale? These are processes that cross jurisdictional boundaries. It's really hard to plan and design across city, county boundaries. As Letitia said, there's this regulatory environment that crosses all of these. But if we can think at this landscape scale, how can one design within an OLU we're calling them OLUs, Im influence the rest of the OLUs, and how do they inter interface across? And so, you know, Robin, everyone's alluded to this already, but I'm really going to talk about what are these big processes and how do they manifest differently along the shoreline. So um, watershed processes, the ocean and the bay, and then where, and then where they interact. So I, I don't need to tell all of you, but here it is anyway. Um, we're sitting right now at the mouth of a really, really, really large watershed. Um, and then within that, we are sitting in a northwest trending, fault-bound, downdrop, uh, downdrop trough. Um, I think that's really important to recognize where we are. And because of that geologic setting, we have a varying topographic typologies around the bay. And I'm sure you, you've noticed this, many of you know this, um, but just as an example, we have steep headlands. Um, that in Marin that run normal to the faults, jutting out into the bay. So you have big headlands diving deep into, like immediately into deep water. So you don't have that buffer. You have high waves. Um, then kind of you know, along the axis here, we have alluvial fans and plains that Letitia was talking about. But this is at a really large scale, kind of pushing into that trough. And you can see this in the surficial geology. You can see these sort of palmate features that I've tried to outline here. Um, 
But really, you can see this in the way we've developed the Bay Area. So um, you, we see that our sort of dense residential land uses are high and dry. They're on these well-drained alluvial soils. In between there, you have kind of these white boxes. Those were wet meadows, seasonal wetlands, much wetter. Um, those were harder to develop. They were developed later. Finally, we have kind of northwest, we have these big wide valleys, Santa Clara Valley, Napa, Sonoma, Petaluma, really different typology there. Here's a shot looking down um, Santa Clara Valley. You can see there was much more space there, it's shallower, much bigger areas for wetlands to form. But also, a lot of those wetlands have subsided for a lot of reasons that we could talk about later, um, but really important to keep in mind. So again, Different areas, because of this, this setting and the processes at work, you have different areas for marshes to form. Um, and that still persists today, even though our marshes have changed dramatically. We have much wider areas of marsh in the northern and southern parts of the bay. On the sides, narrower fringing marshes. That doesn't mean it has to be that way, but those are the patterns that we see because of the processes at work. So all of those um, different typologies are organized into watersheds of many sizes that are delivering water and sediment to the bay, and that's what we see in these storms. And they're delivering different amounts and different rates of sediment of different sizes. So we've done a lot of work characterizing and quantifying the amount of sediment that comes out of these watersheds. Um, we've dammed them, we've done a lot of things to them. This, depend, this doesn't just depend on the slope and um, geology and discharge, but it's about land use and all these other things. Um, and in wet years like we just had, we see, um, real clear signals of our bay, these plumes of sediment coming in, muddying our waters, um, but these are really important processes that happen that build subtidal deltas that nourish our marshes like Letitia was talking about. Um, but a lot of that sediment, because of the way we've um, rearranged our watersheds and our shoreline, a lot of that sediment doesn't make it out to the bay and it winds up getting stuck in flood control channels or getting cast aside um, and used as, I don't know, mountain bike paths. Um, <laughs> but a lot of the work that we've done has been quantifying how much sediment is stuck in those flood control channels. Where is it stuck and where does it come from? Does it come from the watersheds? Does it come from the tidal processes? So a lot more work, these are, a lot of, of more work is being done about this, but um, this is really important. Sediment is a resource and how can you use this sediment of the right size in the right place nearby your projects? Um, this gets to a question before, but you know, we also are trying to work on how do, we, how do we deliver that sediment from the watershed so they don't have to manually scoop it each time. How do we get those creeks to deliver sediment to the backside of marshes so they can keep pace with sea level rise? So in a lot of places you see sort of dog legs or just like unnatural forms in the marsh. So how do we reconnect to the, bal to, um, the marshes to the balans? Our Flood Control 2.0 project, we work with a lot of the county, agency, county agencies, county staff, regional agencies working on this problem, but this is a really big issue um, that I think that you guys could bring a lot new, of new ideas to. Again, that core sediment can also be used for beaches. Beaches are a huge part of our shoreline, um, often kind of forgotten about because they're sort of narrow, um, but core sediment in the right place can do a lot for wave attenuation. So that was the watershed processes. Now we're gonna talk about the oceanic bay processes really quickly. Um, big ocean, small confined bay regulated by the Golden Gate. You probably have all talked about this yesterday. Um, oops. So tidal range really varies. It's, it all rushes in and out through that Golden Gate, um, backs up against the South Bay, so you get much higher tides in the South Bay as it moves north and it goes through San Pablo out to Sassoon, you get lower tidal range. Wave heights, oh, wave heights also vary um, significantly. And so, you know, there's a lot of different ways to think about wave heights paired with which storm. I'm just showing the 100 year storm today. Um, we have, you know, different wave heights based on the shoreline orientation, run up, bathymetry. I took a picture from Jeremy's, this is art on Jeremy's wall, just so I wasn't showing you another map. Um, but our bathymetry is really important to think about. Where do you have mud flats? Where do you have shallow water? Where does your shoreline just drop off into deep water? And what are you designing there um, that's gonna make the best use of, the, of, of what you've got already? Likewise, salinity really varies. Why does this matter? It varies over the, over the course of the seasons. It varies in between years. It really um, changes the um, gradient of what our marshes look like, what species can live there, what plants can live there, and how that changes from the very saline South Bay up around the corner, you get brackish marshes in Martinez and Sassoon, really different morphology, looks really different. 
So where those watershed processes and those ocean processes interact, um, that really helps us think about how sediment moves around once it gets to the bay. How does it move? Does it move, um, does it deposit where you, where it winds up? Does it move in a gyre around the North Bay? Does it disperse down? So when you think about, um, and coarse and fine sediment move differently. And so really needing to understand if you're gonna put something in a certain place, is it gonna stay there or is it gonna move down shore in the next storm? Um, our natural shorelines are also, you know, they are static in a lot of ways, but if you get down really deep, um, they are continuing to evolve. So San Pablo Bay, we've done a study looking at how the shoreline has changed over time. It's really interesting, parts of the shoreline are eroding and parts are prograding. Pro prograding meaning moving out. So here's 1993, this is near Mare Island. This is 2010, it's pretty significant. It's about you know two to three meters per year moving out. 1987 um, to 2016, we're eroding pretty quickly back. Again, these are not insignificant rates of shoreline change. So really important to understand how your shoreline is evolving. A lot of that you can look at um, and see kind of surge channels with neck cutoff shoots, like the, more, the, the edge of the, of the marshes look really different if they're eroding or prograding. But, um, these are important things to understand, and they vary significantly around the bay. So, so that's that side-to-side -side lateral change. But as Letitia and Robin have talked about, we're also thinking about um, how marshes kind of are going to move up and down, and we need them to move up if they're going to keep pace with sea level rise. And yet, many of our marshes are really subsided. So the blue is subtidal already. So we're kind of starting at a deficit here on a lot of our shorelines. And this isn't even talking about all the complexities of how we've built and changed the environment and where we've put, where we've put levees and put berms and um, flood control channels. But we've started thinking about this and mapping out all of the raised structures around the bay. And it was really interesting to realize that about 40% of the bay shoreline, like that first line of defense that wa the water hits, is um, unengineered berms. So not built for flood protection. Um, Another 30% of the shoreline is fronted by some type of wetland or, or beaches, and so those are really significant opportunities. Um, so again, we're trying to think about these, like where do like processes happen, and how can we use operational landscapes units? So when you think about your site, in what operational landscape unit does it fall, and what are the characteristics um, of that unit, and how can that help you um, think about the kind of best design in the best place based on the processes at work? Um, so I think this is an amazing opportunity to be part of for us, and we're really excited about this challenge because I think it's a real opportunity to highlight that the Bay is heterogeneous and diverse and dynamic, and that there's really no one, one size fits all for sea level rise, which I don't need to tell you. Um, you know that intuitively from just looking at these different shorelines built out San Francisco. Um, but even in places where we have really built out um, Foster City building, built out onto a bayland that probably used to look a little like Bear Island, how can we use analogs within an OLU using the beach that we see, the shell beach on Bear Island, and thinking about the design, how to best design the shoreline of Foster City for resilience? Um, so my last point is that let's use science and these processes to help design a resilient shore. Um, if you want to know more of that whirlwind tour, um, we have made this uh, website called the Resilience Atlas live today for you so that you can get a lot of those data sets. Um, we're happy to talk more about it. Here are those Balin goal segments that Letitia was talking about. It's resilience.sfei.org, and we're really looking forward to working with you. Do I have time for questions? I know that was fast. <laughs> Will sea level rise influence the salinity of uh, the bay? And if so, how does that change in salinity uh, affect the marshes? Um, and as a sub-question uh, from uh, experience on the East Coast, we have uh, lots of uh, invasive species, especially Phragmitis. Have you seen any changes, and how would you deal with that if it were to happen? So the question was about how will sea level rise change the salinity in the bay, and how will that change the marshes, and then also about in, in, uh, invasive species. So 
I think the projections say that sea level rise will make will change the bay. It's going to be more dynamic, so it probably will get saltier, or also get flushed more as we have much more like bigger, larger storms flushing it out. Um, there's lots of models about that that we can point you to. Um, in terms of invasive species, we've been dealing with that a lot here. Um, the Coastal Conservancy has funded something called the Invasive Spartina Project over the last several years. Um, I don't know how many years Marilyn can talk about this more later, but um, trying to kind of get at having a native Spartina, um, which has more room, you know, it doesn't create this mat, it create, there's more room for, habit, for habitat, so for birds to, to feed and for marshes to accrete. Um, so there's been a lot of work done about that, trying to um, take out invasive Spartina. Um, Phragmites is a big problem in the Delta, um, and as you move, as you move, you know, I guess I, I wonder, I'm not sure if as you, as salt moves inland, um, are some of those brackish marshes going to turn saltier? It's a really good question. I think they are. Alex has a question. Hi. Thank you. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, let's see. The, um, I just had a question about the uh, landscape um, units. Oh, sorry. The landscape blank units. The what is it? The um, operational, operational landscape, landscape units. units. O L U. Yeah. Um, were those were so were those operational landscape units? So so, I think for designers. I'm not going to go to it because okay. it's yeah. Zoom back. I think I, I think there's a lot of content in the. Uh, oh, can you show the, the? Do you want me to show them? Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I think don't. there's a lot of really great content in what you're presenting here because I think you're showing. Um, uh, uh, you're showing processes at different scales. So I feel like there's a lot of content in the slides that you're showing that I think is going to be relevant and useful and that the design teams are going to hopefully dig into. Um, this is a slide that I'm curious about because I'm wondering whether, um, is this re are those patches really um, indicative of an operational or functional aspect of uh, ecosystem processes across San Francisco Bay? And so, and if so, to me, it seems like these are fairly large scale, although I know that there's some design teams that are thinking about things at this scale and even larger. I'm just curious if you can explain more about the spatial uh, organization of in this slide and whether or not um, those operational units uh, can scale down, scale up, to um, given the understanding of this, the heterogeneity of the system. Right, that's a great question. Um, so how useful are these operational landscape units at a design scale? So. Um, you know, the processes that we're talking about happen at a large scale. And I think what we're really trying to encourage is thinking at a landscape scale. So watersheds really are like self-defining units. The water flows one way when you drop it down on them. When you get down into the baylands, um, because of sewer sheds and how we've changed things and just how flat they are, that really becomes less clear. And so this is in a way trying to figure out like what's the watershed of the baylands? Sort of how are those different? So which creeks feed which OLU? So each one, you know, one or more creeks go into an OLU, but an OLU doesn't split water watersheds. So when you're thinking about sediment supply from a watershed, that would be contained in one OLU. Um, you know, these are sort of similar in scale to the Bale and Goals units, and so those are at an ecological scale where we think patch sizes is really important. So, you know, at, yeah, at, at some degree, like every meter of the bay is really different. And so when you're designing, obviously you need to, an engineer, you need to look exactly at that spot. So this isn't going to do that for you. This is trying to think about what's your sediment supply? What's your general wave energy? What's your like mud flat width distance to deep water? It's really driven by these larger processes because we get a lot, of, we get a lot of questions from, um, people thinking about like, I want to put a horizontal levee here. Is this a good place? You know, do I put a horizontal levee where there's, um, a headland with deep water really, you know, no, and so that's kind of the level that, you know, do beaches, um, you know, were beaches there historically? Will this place support beaches? Is there a core sediment supply nearby? Is the, you know, is there the run up that you need? Is there the drop off to deep water? These are the types of questions. And so I think, I, I think it can be really helpful um, at a design scale to think about, like, do you have the processes within this OLU to support the design that you want to put there? Um, and then I think the other piece that I wanted to say about it is that we think the way we've created these that they really work as a unit. So something that you do in one o OLU, you know, will impact the rest of the OLU. They're, they really are the sort of if you're thinking if you bought into the idea of watershed planning, you know, this is like watershed planning at the bay at the bay edge. Um, our proposed site is at the edge of the purple and the. Brown in the in the, the Alameda County um, 
edge. Do, what do you find at those edge spaces where, and in this case, it's a very mixed, it's industrial, residential, and recreational all combined. It's kind of funky. Yeah, that's a great question that we have thought about a lot, and I don't know that we have a great answer for. I think these operational landscape unit boundaries may be slightly fuzzy. It's really hard to draw a line on something that's a process, as you all know. Um, and so it may be looking at both of those. Um, the intersection of them might incorporate both. Another thing I forgot to mention about this that reminded me with the land use is that we're working with SPUR, um, who are bringing to bear their expertise on the land use side and the policies and land use patterns. And so part of the OLU is to think about you know, what are your opportunities, non-structural maybe, that help you think about different types of land use opportunities in the future. I don't know if that answered your question. Th that particular boundary, we, I'm happy to talk about that particular boundary, but um, a lot of them come down to watersheds and sort of how sediment is delivered, how, the, how sewers, sewer, sheds, sewer sheds change, um, and kind of major changes in orientation along the shoreline. A question back here. I think I'm done. Julie, okay, I'm being told I'm done. But Hi. well, I'm I'm I just wanted to throw out an idea and a question. Um, <clears throat> at the top of that sort of boundary that you've drawn of the bay, there's been mentioned. I think I actually heard the word delta. Um, <laughs> I think I um, watershed a lot processes and systems. So I'm just wondering, will there possibly be a potential for those sections up there that um, they could sort of plug into a be, you know, RBD 2.0 or 3.0 that would phase into delta planning of a similar nature? That's a great question. I think for the RBD folks, I mean, we work a lot in the delta also and, and Sassoon, which often gets forgotten about in the middle, which is included here. Um, but yeah, it is really, it is one estuary. They're very different, um, but they really need to be thought about together. So I think it'd be great. I think the delta needs a lot of this similar work. Um, that, that we're getting in the bay.